Luke chapter 17 this morning. Luke chapter 17. I started uh, this uh, section looking forward to his kingdom last week. Ended up being a two-part message because I really pr pretty much didn't even get to all of point one. And using a lot of introduction and, a, and kind of look at the fact that when you talk about the kingdom and you talk about upcoming judgment... That can become complicated. Some people get frustrated or nervous with the term judgment. We talked about the idea that the, the world looks at God and says, he's a judge, judgeful God. Can I tell you, we said, remember, if somebody committed a crime to you, you'd want them in jail. It's called, we call it justice. It's the same thing. That our sin deserves a level of justice. Same word as judgment. Now, we also explain that the ultimate coming judgment of hell was not created for us. It was created for the devil and his angels. It was not created for us. And so we're going to look today at a, and kind of break down this section of Scripture. Would you follow along as I read Luke 7, 17, beginning in verse number 20. Um, the Bible says this, and when, the, um, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here, O lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteth out of one part under heaven shineth into the other part of heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. But first... Must, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. And to the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also was it in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. And the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is thither, will the eagles be gathered together? Our Father, we ask you to help us to understand what as many consider a difficult passage, not necessarily always because of what it means, but, Father, how the world looks at it as a coming judgment. Father, I pray you'd help us to understand the principle we see. Help us to understand your love and see your love and grace all through this passage, Father. May you be honored in these few moments. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're like me, you turn on the news. And I mentioned last week, I like to listen to different aspects of the news. And if you really want to know the truth, go to YouTube and Facebook. Of course, they've got it. But it is amazing to me how one politician talks about the end of the world is coming because of this. And the other politician says the end of the world is coming because of this. And if you don't follow me and you don't do this and you don't vote for this, then. And you know what they do? They try to scare you. I mean, it's just driven by fear. Hey, if you are this political party and you believe this, then we're going to be gone in three years. And if you believe them, well, then you're going to be broken in three years. And it's amazing how we constantly and continually hear things that scare you. I tell you what, I don't care if it's Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, any of the major networks, Facebook, I don't care. When I turn them on, it's just depressing. Just yes, was it just last night, another shooting in Texas. So inevitably, what five, at least I heard of five killed, 21 injured. So inevitably, people are going to say, we got to get rid of our guns, and we've got to do this, and we've got to do this. And, and I'm not getting into politics. Here's my point. You can't turn on the news without someone trying to scare you into believing their point of view. Years ago, I, uh, um, if you know, my younger sister passed away when she was 18, and uh, Pat Shiraki did a special on her. Uh, this is back when, I think it was channel, whatever channel, I think three she was on. They had what called a bulletin. And they would do, a, I think it was a 30-minute span where they would do special, spe kind of like 2020, but local, and she was on it. And Pat Rocky was handed an award for that called the Gabriel Award. 
And it was for up, you know, it was encouraging pieces. I'm pretty sure they've thrown that award away today because I, it doesn't make ratings. Well, that was really encouraging. I'm not going to watch that. We, we don't want that. We, we are driven and we're driven by it. I mean, throughout the last election, I've already had this coming election, which is still a little ways away. People come, you know, this person wants to do this. And you know, this person wants to do this. And you know, this person wants to do this. And, and I have heard literally that people are, politicians want to destroy the world. And, and, and they're believing this. Uh, but, you know, there's so much talk. I mean, you just watch the news today. You're going to hear about environmentalism. And if we don't get rid of our cars, we're going to be gone. The world's going to disappear in how many, what, 12 years or whatever it is. Racism is rampant and it's going to destroy us. Globalism, no, no, no. Nationalism's the problem. One day, you know what? We just need to colonize a, colonize a new planet and we'll solve the problem. I'm not kidding. These are news headlines, all right? There are people out there trying to find a way to colonize Mars, why are we going to a planet that's already worse than ours to colonize it? Let's just colonize this one, all right? When I watch this, and I look at all of this, and, I, and the point is this. We look at it, and because the world has no idea why all these things are happening. Can I remind you, God is fully aware of everything going on. And now all the things coming, the things that we're afraid of, the tsunamis and the earthquakes and the fires, none of this is a surprise to God. And I hate to tell you, it's only going to get worse. But it's not going to get worse because of this politician or that politician. It gets worse because God said in the last end days, it's just going to get worse. It's going to get worse because we live in a sinful society and sin is destroying our world. And we look at this and we get easy. So it's easy for us to believe that there's no hope and and that can actually make us desperate. The true answer is not found in politics or even science. The true answer is found in Jesus. For many, this is difficult to believe because, well, I don't believe it. See, we talk about the coming kingdom, and we talk about Jesus, and we say, wait a minute, that's crazy talk. You ever been, tell me if you've been told it's crazy talk by somebody, all right? Jesus is crazy talk. They say, there's no way, you're nuts, you just, you want to believe that. Well, and you say, well, he was a good man because no one wants to criticize Jesus. He's one of the most influential characters in history of mankind. Well, he, he was just a good man. Well, there's no way he could have been just a good man because of all the things that Jesus taught. Jesus taught that he was God and he taught that the kingdom was coming. And he taught all those things. So either Jesus was God or he was a great liar. There's no way he could have been just a good man because he would have been exactly what they thought to be a blasphemer. And they, the world looks at it and says, you've got to be crazy. Here's what happens. Here's they say, you know what? You, put your, you live by faith, and that's your problem. Can I tell you today, all of us live by faith. All right? Some of us live by faith in Jesus. Other of us live by, put our faith in scientists. You know, isn't, aren't you excited by scientists? They tell us where we came from, at least where they think we came from. They tell us what's going to happen just this week. A hurricane changed direction. Well, all the way up now, everybody's changed their mind. We can't even figure that out. And we placed our trust in people that, was it 20 years ago, climate change had a different name. And now it's this and now it's that. And when it's really hot, obviously it's climate change. When it's really cold, it's really climate change. And I'm not going to tell you my point of view on climate change. What I'm going to say is this. Scientists are constantly changing their view of what they believe so that they can make what happened today fit their point of view. They have no idea. And two years from now, new scientists will tell the old ones how dumb they are. That's what we put our faith in. Oh, we, I just, but I don't, and we all do. We all live by faith. I'll give you an example of it. When you go, now most of us today, we don't really watch the news as much. We grab our phone, and I have it here, and on the front of my phone, I have a, a degree. It tells me how cold or hot it's going to be. So what do we do? We grab our smartphone. It's smart. We're not. So we hit it, and it tells us the percentage chance of rain today, right? How many do this on their phone? Check there. All right. Some of you older people, my phone does that? You don't even know that yet, all right? And you look at it, and <laughs> you go down, and you say there's a 30% chance. Ah, 40, 45. And you grab your umbrella because your phone told you to. How many do that? All right. I do too. All right. You know the funny part is? Well, I think the phone's a little smarter than the guy who put the in. Because you, a weather forecast, what is it? A guess. Because in a couple hours, you're going to give you an updated forecast or an updated guess. And do we not base our entire life off of these people get paid money to stand there and tell us what's going to happen in the storm? Don't we? I mean, we base everything off of it. We dress a certain way. We act a way. We give up vacations based upon what we think is coming. Sometimes they get it right. 
Sometimes they absolutely wrong. Now here's the point. All of us live by faith. We place our faith in something. And I'm going to encourage you today that as much as we do that, the faith we need to place in is Jesus. And we're going to see much more in the scripture why that is true. You see, we look at all these things and the change in the world and it's crazy because everybody keeps changing their point of view. What we need to understand is that we can't reason away truth. The world tries to find a thousand reasons why truth is not valid. The question is, are we trying to live by reason or we have we learned about a relationship with Jesus? Are we trusting in God for now and what is to come? Or are we just hoping that everyone else is right? The good question is, where am I headed? And what am I doing in the process of that direction? See, the fact isn't simple. The fact is, Jesus one day will destroy this earth, and he will build a new heaven and a new earth. And what he's going to do is a whole lot more than cl- uh, human, uh, man-made climate control could ever, cli- climate, whatever, I'm like getting the word wrong, uh, global warming, more than any of that. I want you to see this passage, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are ye to be in ho- holy conversation and godliness, looking for and, ho- and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, where in the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wind dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Here's the premise, and we'll get into what it means, but there is going to be a coming judgment. The question really is not about the coming judgment. The question is, where are you? on the side. Are you on the side where you're not part of the judgment? Are you on the side where you are? And I'm going to explain what that means. I hope you understand. We really see the grace of God in this. The premise is this. What side of judgment am I on today? And if I'm on the right side of God's judgment, what will I live my life for in light of that future kingdom? Let me explain something when you talk about kingdom. There's two different, and there's, this is when you talk about theology, there's a lot of different points of view on the kingdom of God. Let me give you two, I think, simple things. There's what one may call the external universal kingdom. One day Jesus will come. He will physically make his kingdom. And that's what, what, the, what we're waiting for. It'll happen after the uh, tribulation, after the judgment, and then there'll be a permanent thousand-year reign, and then God will ultimately take over permanently. That's the coming kingdom. Can I give you a suggestion of another one many call spiritual internal kingdom? That is my spiritual heart that is allowing God to rule and reign, where he becomes king of my life. That's a spiritual kingdom. You need to understand those two as we get into this passage. So let's look at four things today quickly. Number one, there is confusion concerning the kingdom. In verse 20 and 21, the Pharisees asked Jesus where the coming kingdom is, and Jesus answered and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You can't see it. Neither shall they say, lo, here it is, or lo, there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Here's the one thing, remember, we mentioned this last week, and I won't take a lot of time on this because we spent a lot of time on it last week. The Pharisees were trying to trip Jesus up, trying to get him into a physical kingdom because everybody wanted them to throw off Rome, throw off the rule, and take over, and they wanted that. And Jesus had over and over said that's not what his time was for coming. He was coming to save souls, not to establish an earthly kingdom at this time. And so he came back and said, listen, you're missing. You can't see the physical kingdom until you understand the spiritual kingdom. That's what he was saying. Until you understand what it means to have Jesus in your heart and to call upon him for salvation and have him rule in your life spiritually, you won't see the kingdom. See, understand this. The Pharisees knew enough about the Bible to know who Jesus was, that he was the Messiah. They rejected him because they could not control him. They refused to allow Jesus to be their king. So let me explain this. The coming punishment one day is not just God, a vengeful God waiting to come down and get us. The punishment is simply this. There is sin in the world and sin deserves, it it demands justice or judgment. But yet in that time, Jesus was placed upon a cross and he's already paid that judgment for you and for me. And he says, if you call upon me and you accept me, when that judgment comes, you won't be part of it. And that is one of the keys to understanding about this idea of the confusion. Let me tell you, don't make it more complicated than it is. The coming physical kingdom is coming. And it's, it, if you're saved, you're going to go to heaven and come back down before you see it, all right? But ultimately, what we need to be doing as Christians is understand that spiritual kingdom is what we need to focus on. 
getting people out of the world into that spiritual kingdom. That should be our drive. It's the only reason God has allowed us to stay here. And wouldn't you think you'd be smarter once you get saved? God just takes you home. Why does he leave you here? So that you can bring others to that point. That's the whole premise. Let's look at number two, the promise of the kingdom. Back in verse 22. And he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, see there, go not after him, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteth out of one part under heaven shineth into the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. Let's look at some things about the promise of the kingdom. Now this one verse is interesting. There will be a day when you desire the Son of Man. Let me tell you, if you don't know what that means, it's real simple. You probably have desired it. Wouldn't you desire a day with no sin? Wouldn't you desire a day with no conflict in the home? Wouldn't you desire a day with no hurricanes? Wouldn't you desire a day with no earthquakes? That's what he's talking about. We will desire a day when sin is thrown off and God reigns in peace. How many of you say, I desire that day? The rest of you aren't awake. All right, we're waking you up here, okay? We desire that. All of us, just, whether we know or not, because we won't see it, because there's still things coming. See, one day sin will be destroyed, natural disasters will be no more, and fear and struggle will be eliminated. Now, here's what happens. He says there'll be some who will say, come here, go there. Here's what they're saying. There will be people out there, and they're not always preachers, who will tell you how to overcome this. This is the problem. Follow, change your economic view, change your environmental view. Follow me and, and what we talked about, all this fear. And they're going to say global warming is the problem, or finance is the problem, or this or that. You know what the Bible says? Don't follow them. And the fur closer we get to the kingdom, the crazier the news will get. And the crazier people are gonna, things they're going to say on TV. And I'm telling you what, I hear some of these things and I read some of these things and I say, you've got to be kidding me. And people are convinced. And I, I've read some articles on both sides of the party. And, and I tell you what, can I tell you, the, they are striving with every bit of their power to get an answer that is only found here. You can't explain what's going on. There's a reason they're called natural disasters. You can't explain them. I do think it's funny that I read something surprised about the hurricane. I'm like, we've had hurricanes for hundreds of years and we're surprised about a hurricane coming. No, I mean, when we went to Puerto Rico, we go to Puerto Rico, one unique thing, you go into the buildings, they're all concrete. The walls, the floors, they're all concrete. And there's no windows in them. I mean, when I mean like physical glass, they have these metal shutters. You close them down, you open them up, but there's no physical glass because they go through hurricanes so often that if a glass is there to blow it out, it could hurt somebody. With the shutters, you open them up, the wind comes through, no big deal. And we've been down there. The place we've been in Puerto Rico has been under hurricanes on multiple occasions. And many of them say, we just stay in our house. It's the safest place you can be. They're, they're used to it. We look at those things and, and the people say, well, follow me, you know, follow this point of view. Can I tell you, God has made it very clear that the world is going to look for an answer and there's not an answer found in the world. It's found in him. And he said, this is coming and I know it's coming. Don't listen. Don't follow the craziness. Don't allow the craziness of people who don't know God trying to figure out the truth. Keep your trust in God, even for end times, because all of this has to come. And unfortunately, it'll get worse before it gets better. Then verse 24, God gives a promise of what's really going to happen. He says, there's going to be some small signs. You'll see some things. The world's going to get more unstable and, and crazier. But all of this is just a sign of his coming. In verse 24, he talks about lightning. Let me ask you a question. Now, today it's a little different. How many of you, when you were younger, when you had, we had this thing called film, the younger kids... Google it, all right? It's called film. You actually put it in the camera. There wasn't a screen where you could see how bad your picture was. You just kept taking pictures. You know what I'm talking about, all right? And then you would take it to the pharmacy, and two weeks later, they give it back to you, and you'd hope. There were, you ever try that? You say, I want to get a great picture of lightning in the distance. You ever try to take picture? You sit there with your camera, and the lightning comes, and you take it, and you take all 24, 48 pictures, right? 30 says, you take it to the pharmacy, you come back, and what do you get? 40 black pictures. That's it. Now, today we don't do that. Today we grab our phone and we just hit film and we videotape it and then we beep, beep, and we record it, right? Life's gotten easier. But you think about how quick, how surprising, how powerful lightning can be. Here's the premise. 
When you look, if you're able to see an entire lightning bolt go down, it takes, you know, fractions of a second, really, when it's all said and done. He goes, we can be able to see bits and pieces of what's happening. Well, in God's kingdom, and his kingdom really comes, it is going to be no joke. It's going to be no surprise. Everybody will know it when he comes and he takes over. Everyone will know. When he comes, there will be no doubt. Titus 2, verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiarly people zealous of good works. He is coming, and we're looking forward to it. Let me tell you, though, when we think about the coming kingdom, I'm going to take a second and explain what I see to be three types of people when we think about the coming kingdom, think about coming judgment, all right? I, I, to just pretend right here in the middle, right here at the podium is there's a cross. Let's just picture this. So let's say if I'm on this side of the platform, I'm someone who has already placed my trust in Jesus. I've already done it. Because of that, because I've called upon Jesus, I have been given guaranteed assurance that heaven is my home. I can't lose this salvation. I can't do enough to lose it. God paid all my sins upon the cross. It's done with. I can't lose my salvation no matter how bad I am. Now, as I, if I'm truly saved, I will grow and become better. I believe if you continue to get worse, maybe you never got saved to begin with. But someone who's saved will grow, but they will still struggle and sin. Then there's somebody, let's say they're real close. They're like, hmm, it kind of makes sense. But I, I don't know, I'm hearing what the world says and there's a lot of craziness and the world pins religion as bad and evil and intolerant and, and I don't know. And, and you're still in the, you, you agree that the scientists are about as crazy as what you think church is and you sit here, there's something inside of you that tells you, no, this is right, but you just can't seem to quantify. Then there's a third person who's over here who's already said, I want nothing to do with that. I want nothing to do with God. I want nothing to do with church. I want nothing to do with the Bible. I want nothing to do with it. Now, when judgment comes, let me explain what's going to happen. The person over here is going to watch. They're not going to be part of judgment. They are freed from the judgment. The person who is close, it's really their decision. If they call upon Jesus, they will go to the other side, and they'll be freed from the judgment. This person will be at the judgment. They'll say, if you believe not, the Bible says, if you believe not, you are condemned already. So if I stand here and I look and say, I want nothing to do with it, God will let me have my way. And when judgment comes, that's where I will be. And there's no way out of it. You say, I don't believe it. My believing, it doesn't change the truth of it. It's going to come. So those over here, this is a frightening situation, a frightening passage. For those here, hopefully it's a great passage that helps me to see why. Because can I tell you, God doesn't want us to be here. God doesn't even want us here. He died upon the cross, and then he calls upon you, and he wants you to receive a gift. Why? So that you can come over here and be guaranteed to skip the punishment. That's what God wants. He doesn't say, join a church or baptism, that's all later. He just says, will you put your trust in me? Put your trust in him. Place your trust in Jesus. It's as simple as that. And don't, don't try to over-quantify it or try to figure it out because it doesn't make sense. Because why would someone die on a cross for someone he, he, that he knows is going to maybe reject him or someone he knows wants nothing to do with him? That's the love of God. That he would offer you something that we just don't deserve. So let's look at number three, the time of his kingdom. In verse 25 to 30, I won't read the whole passage, but it talks about two stories. It talks about as it was in the days of Noah, and then it talks about as it was in the days of Lot. There's two things I want you to see in this that I think are very interesting. The first part is it says that they were marrying and giving in marriage. The other says they were buying and selling and building. Here's what it means. They were living life like it's normal. Now, the next thing in our prophetical chain that I believe is coming is what we call the, the rapture. It's going to be the same idea. America is going to live life like everything's normal. Can you imagine at a wedding and half the people, can you, hopefully this will happen, at the wedding and the preacher disappears? I said hopefully, okay. Hopefully that will happen. It kind of killed the wedding, right? There's no one there to do the, do the wedding. Can you imagine what it must be like? They're living life. You're, you're going through the cash register to buy your food and the cashier's no longer there. That's what's coming next. And the world is going to be in absolute chaos. And up to that point, we're going to live like everything's fine. That's what's coming. 
And that's what he's saying. They live like, and there's preachers who tell them the truth. I mean, in the days of Noah, they lived and married and gave in marriage while they watched the old man build a boat preaching about rain. And when rain came, they wanted the boat and they couldn't get on. You see, when the judgment does come, it's too late. Because prior to it, God has over and over begged you to come to him. But you know, let me tell you something interesting. We see in both the stories, the story of Lot, the same thing. They were in, they were filthy. The worlds were filthy. By the way, both in the story of Noah and Lot, the people were filthy. Sin was rampant. They were living life as if God no longer existed and that evil had won. But there's something else interesting in both stories. God called someone out of both of those situations. He called out Noah and his family to build a boat. He called out Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's always been a small remnant that God will use. Now, we are that remnant, and it's our responsibility in this time to take advantage to make that group even bigger. And not just sit back and say, I'm glad I'm not going there. But to be someone who sees beyond what's happening. One of the things that my wife makes fun of me, when I get moving around places, my mind disappears. I kind of get off what I'm supposed to be doing. And I'll be thinking about other things or, you know, going through my mind what's going up. And I have a tendency, it's one of the reasons I run into walls. I'm not paying attention. Well, this week, I did that. I walked around the corner out from the basement. And from the corner of my eye, I saw something but did not pin it as a person until they scared the daylights out of me and screamed at me. Now, my first reaction is push and hit the person next to me. And then I realized it was a nice young lady and I didn't want to punch her. So I started hitting the wall. You know what I would learned there? I got to wake up and pay attention to what's going on. I was a believer. I think I was singing a song. Thing. I was at all of a sudden, ah! and I tell you what, it was not fair. Payback's coming. But that's beside the point. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, we can live just that way. We go through life completely oblivious of the fact that this what we're in right now is not the end. We worry about retirement. We worry about all, and we should. I, I, we, my wife and I give the retirement. We should plan. If God does not allow us, if, you know, if God does not allow us to be taken the rapture, we've got to plan for the future. But we've gotten so busy planning for the future that we forgot that God did not put here to fix a bank account or to, to worry about my house or my car. God kept me here to let the world know that this is coming. And we can get so engulfed with everything that's happening today on the news and in our life that we forget that God says this is coming. Don't just get lost in life. It's temporary. And judgment's coming. And oh, may we never not allow ourselves to be lost in just the fact that, it, well, I'm just going to live the way it is. Then I'm going to look at last thing at the imminence of the kingdom. When you see a couple things, verse 30 to 37, and even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he shall be on the housetop. He which shall be on the housetop. And his stuff in his house, let him not come down and take it. And he that is in the field, let him likewise may not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Don't be so focused on the things of the world that you miss what's coming. Because if you are focused, because if you save your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life, you preserve it. You get so consumed with the things of the world. This is the unsaved. So consumed with the things of the world, they don't see that this is so temporary. He said two will be in a bed, two will be in a field. What was the point? Simply talks about the imminence of everything that's happening here. Then in verse 37, the disciples answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Where, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. I'll be honest with you, as I evaluated and looked at a bunch of commentaries, there's all kinds of different points of view of what they're talking about. Obviously, it's talking about judgment. It's not talking about the rapture. It's talking about judgment. Some will be yanked out to judgment. Some will be left. But it's interesting. Let me tell you what I believe this is referring to. Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 19. I want you to see this, and then we'll be finished. Revelation chapter 19. I didn't put it on the screen. I don't think I did. Um, I wasn't planning to put it on the screen because it's just a longer passage, and I want you to see it. Revelation chapter 19. It's actually right towards the end of the book, which means end of the book, which means end of what we know, of what's coming. Revelation chapter 19, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 11. And as we read this, you might see some familiarity to what we just read. Revelation 19:11. I saw heaven open. 
And behold, a white horse, and him that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And who is that talking about? Jesus, when he's coming back. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, you know what's cool? Guess who is in verse 14? We are. If you're, if you're saved now, when you go to heaven, that's you coming down with Jesus. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with the rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and in his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God. That ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of heroes, and them that sit on them, and the flesh of all of them, both free and bond, both small and great. What did it say in Matthew? Where the birds will gather. I believe that's what he's talking about. That final judgment. And that final judgment God will separate, and those ultimately who have not called upon Jesus will be placed in a place called hell. Ultimately in the final judgment. We look at all, and a lot of talk about how it breaks down, but here's the key. This is coming. Jesus will come, and the Bible says with a sword out of his mouth, basically, he won't fight. He'll just speak words, and his enemy will die. You say, now, that's, that's frightening. Yes, if you're the person over here who says, I want nothing to do with any of this, it's frightening because it's true. And no amount of reasoning, no politician, no scientist can ever prove it wrong because the Bible says at some point, every one of them will kneel before Jesus. If you're here, this should be encouraging. Why? Because God doesn't want you there. He wants you saved. And he's calling you probably right now saying, this is what you've been looking for your entire life. You've been looking for the truth of Jesus, not of church and of religion, but of Jesus. Can you know what though? If you're over here, this is our hope. Because as bad as the world gets, when it's all over, I stand righteous before an almighty God. You know, when you hear the phrase, we win in the end, that's the passage. This is Jesus winning in the end. So I ask you two things as we finish. Do you know for sure if you die today, you'd go to heaven? Do you know that when this judgment is coming, you'll, what side you'll be on? The side that God doesn't want you on of judgment or the side of hope? If you're here today and you say, I really don't know what side I'm on. If you have any doubts at all, you know you can know for sure. The Bible makes it clear. And let me tell you, it's not my point of view as a preacher. It's not the Baptist point of view because there's so many points of view. We will take the Bible and we will share God's word with you. That's what we want to do. It's all we want to do. We don't want to do anything else. We don't want to add more confusion. We will give you the Bible and let you decide. Wouldn't you love to know what God said about heaven, about what God said about, G about eternity? Wouldn't you love to know what God said about forgiveness and the free gift? You can have that today. In a little bit, we're going to sing a song in just a little bit. And we'll have what we call an invitation. There'll be counselors up front, and I would encourage you to come during that time. We will not embarrass you, but we will give you a chance to learn from the Bible the truth of heaven. Here's the next question. Have we gotten lost and engulfed with all the things of the world, and they have to be done. We have to eat. we got to pay the bills. we got to work. We have to do those things. But we, if we come so consumed that we miss what's really coming. Now, it may not come in our lifetime, but it doesn't matter. In my lifetime, I have an opportunity to reach this world. Am I taking advantage of the time that I have been given? Father, we love you. We thank you for the time you've given us. And I pray, speak to our hearts, Lord. Now I pray you help us to understand the truth that is found in Jesus, Lord, that this truth is not a religion.